If you've been on the internet lately, odds are you've seen some crazy things. And no, I'm not talking laboo-boos. I'm talking conspiracy theories. Everything these days is a wild conspiracy, which comes as no surprise considering both the education and the mental health crises plaguing the country. Unfortunately, some of the biggest conspiracy theories stem from, of all things, the weather. And that's where I come in. You know, a few years ago, I was in a bar in Slidell, Louisiana, and a guy came up to me, saw my My Radar shirt, and started shrieking about Bill Gates and weather modification and space lasers. Who, who, who is they? In what way could a satellite modify weather? What, 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 hang on, what, what, what is a beam of energy? Where would a satellite get huge amounts of energy? Okay, so, so hang on. You're saying a, a satellite has a solar array big enough to modify the weather. Who, who is they? Where is this energy coming from? So, so sun, sunlight. So to put up even a football field solar array into space, which is essentially the limit of what we can put into space via a satellite, that's going to make a negligible difference whatsoever. It, it's not a matter of I don't think we can, it's that I know we can. So let's set the record straight. I teamed up with Will Kano. We're going to break down some of the most popular, erroneous, fantastical conspiracy theories, and hopefully get folks on the right path. Let's start with HARP. I get an insane number of messages, comments about HARP on every Facebook, Twitter post, YouTube video. Tornado in Arkansas, it's somehow HARP. Hurricane in Florida, it's HARP. The pancake prices go up at Denny's, it's HARP. And the best part is people have no idea what HARP actually is or even what it stands for. The acronym stands for High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. It's an antenna array based in Gakona in Southeast Alaska. It's like a big radio transmitter and listener it's researching the ionosphere, or a layer of Earth's atmosphere, about like 30 to 930 miles above the ground. It's way up there. The ionosphere is a region of electrons and charged atoms and molecules that surrounds the Earth. It's kind of like a shell way up there. It gets that charge due to solar radiation, aka energy from the sun. And it's been around since long before humans walked the Earth. It'll be here long after we're gone. Those charged particles reflect or refract radio signals back to Earth, allowing us to communicate over long distances. Sometimes the signals sort of skim along the ionosphere. You get that skimming for frequencies below about 40 megahertz. Above 40 megahertz, the signals sort of propagate through the ionosphere, but not necessarily along. The signals emitted by HARP help us to understand the ionosphere more, as well as learn more about signal propagation. All the research is available online. It's peer-reviewed. It might be a little dense to read, but if you learn the background material, you can read it and understand it too. And we all rely on signal propagation in our daily lives. Anything that uses the internet, any phone, any TV, any radio, any signal that goes anywhere is signal propagation. And I know somebody out there right now is going, electromagnetic waves? Chill. Sunlight is electromagnetic waves. All light is electromagnetic waves. Literally all light. Ooh. Was that too much? <laughs> now, how much energy is HARP using? About 3.6 megawatts, or roughly the energy usage of about 500 homes. Now, we should clarify, radio waves do not affect the weather. But what if we could use that energy from HARP and try to affect the weather? Would it work? Hell no. That's because the atmosphere transfers about 5 petawatts of energy through each hemisphere every year. Heat transfer, that's, that's what drives weather systems. A petawatt is equal to 1 quadrillion watts, meaning the atmosphere in one hemisphere transfers 6 billion times more energy than a harp uses. And that's just one of two hemispheres. The difference in scale is enormous. Claiming harp controls the weather is like someone trying to argue that a 500 pound man cannonballing into the ocean in California was responsible for the 2011 Pacific tsunami. Simply stated, it's ludicrous. Now here's a good one. Operation Popeye. People love to talk about this one. It was a secret military operation during the Vietnamese War between 1967 and 1972. And everybody, all the conspiracy theorists is like, well, it was a secret. So is literally everything in a war. Anyway, this was during the early days of research into weather modification and cloud seeding. And the government believed they could spray lead iodide and silver iodide in very small particulates 
into the atmosphere to foster the coalescence of water droplets. They get water droplets, cloud droplets to gather, to amalgamate, and to fall as raindrops, enhancing rainfall. Their goal was to make more rain in Vietnam and widen monsoon season. They figured they could wash out key routes of supply transfer and therefore make it tougher on their enemies. According to government documents, testing began back in October 1966 in the Lao Panhandle and the Sekong River. There were three C-130 Hercules aircrafts and two F-4C Phantoms that were in charge of dispersing the chemicals twice a day. Now, the government claims this worked very effectively. They also claim they unintentionally flooded a special forces camp with nine inches worth of rain in four hours. But here's the thing. Cloud seeding doesn't create moisture out of thin air. It just helps the moisture that's already up there fall down. It's useful in desert environments, but believe me, if you've been to Vietnam during monsoon season, and I have, the atmosphere doesn't exactly need help raining. Now, because this was classified and sort of a, a clandestine operation, scientists never got to go in and actually test to see if any of this was really meteorologically legitimate. And I can tell you as an atmospheric scientist, the government was probably overzealous in bragging about the efficacy. They were almost certainly overestimating and embellishing. My best guess is there may have been a marginal increase in rainfall. We're talking like five to 15% on the fringes of monsoon season. So maybe April, May, or October, November. But believe me, if this worked nearly half as well as the government wishes it did, the world wouldn't be losing hundreds of billions of dollars in crops every year that succumb to inveterate drought. Now, how about hurricane modification? It's been in the news lately. We'll start with Project Cirrus, one of my favorite conspiracies. On October 13th, 1947, a couple B-17s and a B-29 flew about 415 miles east of Jacksonville and dumped 180 pounds of dry ice into a hurricane. And the hurricane starts to weaken, and they're like, nice, we did it. And then the next day, they fly back in. They can't find the eye. Come to find out the entire hurricane has taken a dramatic sudden left-hand turn it goes into Savannah, Georgia and causes $2 million worth of damage. Now, obviously, 180 pounds of dry ice is not going to do anything and had nothing to do with the hurricane turning or re-strengthening, but they didn't know that at the time. In reality, a single hurricane churns through about 200 times more energy than the entirety of humankind produces. But back then, we didn't really know that. Still, the results from Project Cirrus were enough to essentially scare the government into halting all research into weather modification until 1962. That's when the U.S. Weather Bureau and the Department of Defense teamed up for Project Storm Fury. Their goal was to fly aircraft just outside the eyewall, that innermost ring of winds at the core of intense hurricanes. They figured they could spray silver iodide to seed the clouds, intensifying convective or, or thunderstorm cells outside the eye wall, creating new clouds, essentially creating a newer, wider, weaker eye wall, and choking off the inner eye wall. They only did this on four different storms over the course of eight different days. The storms were Hurricane Esther back in 1961, Beulah in 1963, Debbie in 1969, and Ginger in 1971. And it worked half the time, or so they thought. But then they started noticing it was also happening in storms they never did this to, they never seeded in. Come to find out later on, eyewall replacement cycles are a very normal part of a hurricane life cycle. Every hurricane has it happen. The inner eyewall will be shed into the eye, it'll weaken, it'll wither, and a new eyewall will take shape around it. And sometimes that new eyewall contracts and tightens and becomes stronger, and sometimes it just kind of stays wide and weaker. It's sort of like a snake shedding its skin, but of course we didn't know that back in the 1970s. Okay, are we talking about chemtrails? Chemtrails. Chemtrails. Ah, uh, yes. A theory that's become one of the most prominent explanations behind weather manipulation. Chemtrails are what people call these white lines across the otherwise blue sky. Some look noticeably different than others. Some last for hours on end. But they're not government chemicals and they're not controlling the weather. Here's the evidence. Chemtrails is just wordplay on contrails. It's just an abbreviation for condensation trails. The name fits the bill, it literally describes the white trail of condensation formed behind airplanes. Jet exhaust releases water vapor into the atmosphere. Up high, the air is freezing, much colder than the water vapor. This difference quickly leads to condensation and a cloud is formed in the plane's path. It's exactly like the white exhaust you see out of a car in the wintertime. All contrails share the same general characteristics, wispy, thin, translucent, just like a cirrus cloud. But they're not all created equal. A higher plane is in a colder environment, so its contrails can stay for longer. They might spread out or stay linear. 
Planes with four engines produce more water vapor than those with two, so they might look different. Or in a warm, humid environment, you might not get contrails at all. But these differences do not equate to conspiracy. No typical airliner is releasing chemicals to manipulate the weather. Even when we talk about cloud seeding, it is an entirely different argument. At the end of the day, it's very easy for misunderstood science to be quoted, taken out of context, repurposed on erroneous blog sites, and to quickly become a viral conspiracy theory. It is true that weather modification could theoretically happen at the global scale, but it would require an enormous global effort. To implement something at scale would be such a monumental task that it would test the limits of what humanity could achieve. It has not happened. It likely will not in our lifetimes. It does sort of crack me up that people will push back against me explaining why greenhouse gases, many of which are emitted by humans, can slightly raise Earth's temperature, and yet many of those same people believe the government can send them a tornado. Wild mental gymnastics happening. Ultimately, though, I believe education is empowering. The only way to correct a misconception or a conspiracy theory is through education. We hope you've learned something here. And if you have, talk to your crazy Uncle Larry about it at Thanksgiving dinner. I'm sure that'll go well. I'm my radar senior meteorologist, Matthew Capucci. We will always stand by the science, and that is a promise. Follow my radar on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download my radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, and Windows.